Yeah, Donna, we, we do see you and it does light up yellow when you speak. So um, just take a look at your camera and make sure there's nothing covering it. Other than that, you might have lost a connection. You might have to go out and go back in again. That's the, the fancy way of saying, you know, turn it off and turn it on again. The best IT advice anyone can give. <laughs> okay, well, at least you at least you can hear my name, I guess. Can you hear me? Video. <laughs> okay. Shall we? Uh... Well, okay. We're calling to order the Community Advisory Committee meeting of May 26th, 2021. And they've asked me to do a roll call in which I will probably slaughter your names. So, so. <laughs> So we'll start out citizens at large. Andrew, R, is it Red, Red Redinger? Um, Paul Wiggins? Now remember say, you're, you're, you know, you, you always say what you wanna do, even though we tell you, but uh, if you're here or not, Carol Campbell, David Betzler, here. Here. Uh, vacant, not here. Vacant, not here. Uh, Patty Benger. Benger. Hi, Patty Benger here. So Sharon Brown, I see you over there. Yeah, here. <laughs> okay. Roy Rosenthal. Here. Myself, I'm here. Rick Hoover. Here. Maylee Foster. Uh, I made it a few minutes late, but I made it. <laughs> We're just starting. You're good. Um, Tanisa Sultana. Did I slaughter that name? Okay. Gordon. Gordon Rick. Isn't that supposed to be Rick Gordon? Gordon Rick. You got it correct. Okay. I'm here. Two first, first names is always a bear. Uh, Sharon Roars. Shelly Roars here. Oh, you're right. It was Shelly. Okay, Donna Wood. Here. Bill Bowles. Here. Here. Ann Ash. Here. Thank you, Ann. Um, Terry Hayes. Ed Dills. Jessica McMulley. Mullen. And I'm here. And Jessica Bechtel. I added that. <laughs> okay. Yes, we have. Okay. The next item are uh, the uh, consent item. We have uh, the agenda, the minutes under the agenda. If there's any modification, changes, or something you'd like to add, speak now. Hearing none, uh, I need a motion to approve the agenda. All signify by saying aye. 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 Motion Aye. approved. Uh, <laughs> do we, need, do we not need a second? My apologies. We do need someone to make the motion to approve the consent items. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Patty Benger, I'll make it. that motion. Sharon Brown, I will second to approve all three consent items. All those in favor again, signify by saying aye. 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 Same sign. Okay. Anybody have a chance to read the minutes from last time? Nope. We have, we approved all the consents, so we're on to public comments. Pardon? We have done that, so we need a motion <laughs> for the minutes. No, no, no. We don't? No. We made a motion for all three. I didn't know that. <laughs> okay. So the public can uh, email general comments or comments regarding the agenda in advance of the meeting to the administrator, Bechtel, at PP acg.org have we received it none have been received Just, too late What's sorry up? go ahead uh, this is laura cruz mobility coordinator um there was some public comments that i would like to discuss um but i will discuss that when i do my presentation that came out of the cac um with our funding decision okay thank you tac sorry <laughs> it's just I always say cat, and I know that's wrong. Um, 
and the action items, uh, excuse me, before that legislative session update, Jessica McMullen will, under policy and communications manager, you're up. Good afternoon, everyone. So as you know, it is that legislative session season. You will likely only get one more update on this in this style. Um, we are hoping that the legislative session will end um, by June 12th. Uh, it's still in the air. Um, so since our last meeting, the state's long bill, the budget bill was passed, uh, already has been signed by the governor and there's already small bills going through that are related to appropriations. So if you're tracking things very closely, you may have seen here's transportation funding. We haven't taken a position on it. It was all part of this state bill funding. We did get the transportation funding bill, Senate bill 260, sustainability of the transportation system. This is the one we've been telling you all session would be incoming. This bill is long, it's about 172 pages. <laughs> and there's a lot of details to it. And there have already been quite a few amendments to it. When we first reviewed the bill, we requested two major amendments. We asked for an increase to the general fund contribution. And we asked for them to look at the aspect of a specific section, section it was 28 and is now 29 after amendments, that made the project report go to the Air Quality Control Commission instead of CDOT. Um, it's an interesting aspect. There's, there's been a lot of discussion going on along that. We were able in coordination with our lobbyist and our wonderful delegation to get them to increase the general fund contribution that has been done. Uh, John may be able to phrase this better than I, but the air quality and CDOT, well, transportation commission issue is still My understanding is that it's being tossed around as it is actually reporting to the Transportation Commission and CDOT rather than air quality, but it's written in a way that makes it much stronger that it's air quality. John, is that is that what you've been understanding as well? The, the issue is that ultimately the Air Quality Control Commission uh, would have control over the region's long range transportation plan. And given that we don't know what the greenhouse gas rulemaking will entail, it is possible that the greenhouse gas budgets are such that uh, um, it will be difficult for us to hit those targets. And as such as mitigation, um, it could require us to do switch projects from projects we um, would like to implement uh, to projects uh, that would uh, have to come off the list uh, approved by the Air Quality Control Commission. Uh, additionally, if we go into non-attainment um, and we are not following the rules, uh, the Air Quality Control Commission could then also um, have control over our uh, um, multimodal, uh, multimodal Mitigation Option Fund, or MMOF. Um, these are, uh, I'm, hopefully the word usurption is not too strong for anyone, but it is a usurption of local control of project selection, um, and that is a concern. Um, Given that we don't know what the greenhouse gas rules are, we might be overreacting. Uh, we might actually be underreacting. It could actually be far worse than we think, but we just don't know. So that's why we're making sure that everybody is engaged in the process um, and you can judge for yourself uh, where it is and, and how much faith you have uh, that the final rulemaking that is overseen by the Air Quality Control Commission um, actually um, addresses these issues in a, in a fair and meaningful way. So John did just describe one of those two major issues. There have been several other bills, of course, that we have been monitoring and engaging on. We are supporting House Bill 21-1227. It's a Medicaid nursing facilities demonstration of need. The state ombudsman program believes that it will increase the number of Medicaid beds that we're able to have. Highly important issue for older adults is the access to nursing facilities. And opposing some bills, as John just mentioned, um, greenhouse gases have some, been a topic in many different ways. Senate Bill 21200, um, the governor has currently said he will veto this bill if it passes. It does not align with the greenhouse gas emissions roadmap 
that the governor's office worked with volunteers over two years to create. Um, so the PPACG board of directors is opposing that bill. Uh, House bill 1286, energy performance for buildings. On review of that bill, it looks like it would greatly increase the cost of business. Um, and one of the PPACG legislative priorities is to help support the economic vitality of our region. And they have chosen to oppose the Senate Bill 238, the Creating the Front Range Passenger Rail District. Um, that bill does continue to go. There are a number of updates on previous bills, including the Veterans Hiring Bill, which we supported, House Bill 1065 from our wonderful Representative Terry Carver, um, had, had an amendment added that would have created some complications. That amendment has already been removed. So we did a interesting temporary move from support to amend and now we're back to support because the issue has been resolved. And see, does anyone have any questions about any of those bills? Or if you went to the legislative tracking site, that's where all of our bills are always kept up to date. And you can always find out what PPACG's positions are and where the bill is at the moment. Anybody have any questions? What about the Air Force uh, Space Force? United States Space Force. Oh, okay. Nice uh, what about, what, what is the, the position and what are we working with for the uh, United States Space Force? Are we supporting? So that specific bill we are monitoring um, rather than engaging on, it is relating to minor funding aspects with the National Guard and its interaction with Space Force. It's, it's one of those bills that it was not a PPACG issue in its context. Okay. Um, so obviously we do support our local military, but that bill was- We're gonna put troops on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, is John still available? Yeah. John, are you still there? This I have a question for you. John DeVoe from Woodland Park. Um, is there anything that is, uh, is being planned for the replacement of gasoline taxes with the kind of rapid advance of electric cars? So with embedded within this uh, uh, Bill 260, um, is a number of fees. Um, first of which is um, there is an eight cent fee uh, that is added to the gas and, and diesel taxes. Uh, so you'll, you'll see an increase there. But additionally, and I, hopefully I can name them all off the top of my head, but Jessica, if you have the bill in front of you, feel free to jump in. Um, there is a fee on um, Uber and Lyft uh, based on uh, when they pick you up, uh, that's so that will generate funding. Uh, there is an additional fee on um, Amazon for package delivery, um, a, a kind of a cost per package, uh, but they've worked it in such a way that if, if a package gets re-delivered, you're not charged again. Um, and then there is also uh, something on the car rental. So they've tried to actually with uh, this uh, Senate Bill 260 diversify uh, the funding base uh, with some of these fees. Additionally, the um, fee on electric vehicles, currently I believe it's $50 and $30 of that actually goes into uh, the state uh, 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 transportation or highway user transportation fund uh, that actually uh, funds the roadway uh, uh, maintenance. That through this bill is going to be indexed and increased um, over I believe an eight year period uh, another $96. So it will bring parity somewhat uh, to uh, what you would pay if you're in a, um, a, a gas uh, powered vehicle. Um, you will still pay more if you're driving your, your traditional uh, gasoline propulsion engine uh, vehicle, uh, but that additional fee will bring some parity and, and increase that as well. So still heavily dependent on um, fossil fuels, 
um, for the overall transportation uh, budget, which as you uh, in, uh, intimated uh, is not sustainable over time, uh, but this helps with that. Um, and hopefully over the long term, um, adjust, additional adjustments can be made uh, to kind of get us away from, from that because you're absolutely correct. Um, the, the gasoline tax uh, income will go down um, as we have more of an electronic fleet. Did, did that answer your question, sir? And uh, Jessica McMillan, did I skip anything that you, you want to add? I thought I read something coming out of Denver. They want to give more incentive uh, and, and less cost to, to electric vehicles. As fast as that industry seems to be expanding, I mean, we still got to plow the roads for them. We still have to pray, pave the roads for them. Exactly. And uh, that, that whole thing, at some point in time, they got to they got to do their fair share. I don't know if there's a lot of pressure from the electric industry for cars, of trying to get some incentive to do it. All they got to do is make them go 300 miles on, on, on a gallon of, on, a, on a tank of uh, electricity, and have enough places around all the gas stations will probably put in charging stations, because until that network is there, it's not going to happen. Right. Um, and, and again, I apologize if I'm, I'm going off script and making your meter lo longer than you, you want it to be. But I will say uh, that uh, part of SB 260 is of the, oh, and again, um, I'm, I'm pulling the numbers out of my old brain and uh, I might not be as accurate as you'd like. I think of the $5.6 million, billion, excuse me, $5.6 billion that's generated um, by the uh, SB 260. Uh, part of that comes from these new fees that we're talking about. Uh, part of it comes from um, the uh, um, stimulus package, and, and part of it comes from uh, the general fund. Of that, about a third of it is going to electrification. So they will create, I believe, and again, Jessica, correct me if I'm wrong, five new enterprises um, with these uh, funds. And one of those enterprises will help with the electrification of the bus fleet. Um, one of these enterprises will work at the um, electrification infrastructure. So there'll be more charging stations, uh, stations, let's articulate that, uh, charging stations around uh, the state. So that will also uh, increase the ability when you're driving your electric vehicle, you don't have to have that uh, range anxiety. You'll have more places to stop and charge. Um, another enterprise um, will deal with um, helping people um, uh, purchase uh, electric vehicles uh, as well as um, have the, that personal infrastructure necessary to charge those vehicles. Um, I think those are the three electrical uh, uh, based um, enterprises. Uh, there's another one I think that has to do with air quality conformity uh, that is mostly in the Denver Boulder area. and um, I think the other enterprise, um, I can't really remember, but a, a large portion of this of the funding is going towards um, electrification. I remember, uh, I think it was last year, we had transportation from the Springs come in here and said when they did the study on the electric buses, they were the cost was higher than if they simply maintained uh, the current fleet that they had. So. And but that'll come down as technology changes. That'll come down. Uh, yes, sir, that's correct. As the technology changes, uh, they become more attractive. Additionally, as the age of the fleet that the city of Colorado Springs currently owns, uh, as it gets older and needs to be replaced. Um, so over time, electrification makes uh, more sense. And the sort of the good news on this is uh, SB 260, um, if passed, uh, does help provide uh, more funding uh, for uh, electric buses um, and the fund source for MMT to, to tap uh, to make that happen. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions for John? Yeah, John, Dave Betzler here. Just a question on the enterprises themselves, the five that will be set up. <clears throat> Can you tell us a little bit about the, the funding of those enterprises? I think I've read something to the effect that they are or will be sort of a uh, independent, if you will, from uh, oversight by, by citizens and that they, their funding, they, they will have some authority to be able to increase their, their fees, if you will, to continue their operation. 
Uh, well, if we were playing, uh, you know, what what's my line? I'm going to have to flip the cards and say you've stumped me. I don't have that uh, 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 committed to memory. Uh, but yes, you're correct um, in that uh, of the different enterprises, some some of the different fees that we've talked about uh, that are collected specifically go to those enterprises, um, and that is their um, their funding stream. Um, and I also can can confirm that yes, there there will be uh, uh, commissioners to oversee those different enterprises. But the powers of those commissioners, uh, that's where you've stopped me. I do not have that committed to memory. Like Jessica said, the bill started at 197 pages and has been amended. So now it's well over 200. Uh, and I quite frankly, uh, that is one thing that I did not commit to memory. So unless Jessica, you can help out there, um, I'm afraid that's one we're gonna have to get back to you on. There's not. I can share the transportation funding proposal summary that was created, and I'll send that out to everybody after this meeting so that you can look at it. It, it goes, it talks about what those enterprises are, how much they're expected to um, collect. So we got that at the beginning of the bill. So obviously things may be tweaking as we go, but I'll send you what they sent us at the beginning of the discussion. Anybody else have a question for John, whether you're remote or here in person? Okay, John, thank you again. Thank you. Okay, our next item is item. Okay, we got through the legislative. Did you have anything more in legislative? Okay, action items would be next. The first one is FY21-24, TIP amendment number 12, Catherine Wagner, senior transportation planner. Catherine, you're on. Well, uh, Catherine is uh, on vacation. She is touring uh, wonderful Alaska with her husband. So for those of you that ever watch soap operas, you know, at the very beginning when they say, today the part of Catherine will be played by, the part of Catherine will be played by John. So uh, I'm going to do my best to get you through these um, uh, amendments. Uh, excuse me, the, these three uh, I, action items that were normally would have been Catherine's. Um, I think two of them you've seen before, so let's knock wood uh, that you've, you've had all your questions answered and those two run pretty smoothly. Uh, one you haven't seen before, at least that's my understanding, I've, I've been wrong before, um, is uh, tip amendment number 12. And for those of you who are not familiar, the Transportation Improvement Program is basically a, a capital improvement list of the projects that the region will be doing uh, with our federal funds or are using non-regional, excuse me, non-federal funds, but are regionally significant and therefore federally required to be incorporated within the transportation improvement program. So it's a, it's a federal requirement for those of you who are relatively new, but that's what the TIP is. It becomes necessary um, and it seems like on a monthly basis, since we're already up to amendment 12, uh, that uh, we do need to amend it to make sure that it is accurate. And the reason is, is because it is the document by which uh, the jurisdictions or the sponsors of the different projects can go to the feds and say, um, we're ready to obligate those funds and get the money for the project. Um, for them to do that, it's required to be in the TIP. So that's why uh, these things are important. So amendment number 12 that you have in front of you in your packet, uh, there are three items. Uh, one is just a scope change uh, to a mountain metro transit item. Um, so we're not adding a project or changing the funds for the project. We are uh, changing uh, merely the scope. And I think the way it was worded before, it was ambiguous as to if it would include um, new const construction of new um, uh, bus stops for the American Disability or ADA um, compliance. So this is just a, a text change um, that MMT is required to have so it can move, uh, move forward on the construction of some bus stops. Uh, the other two projects um, came out of a, uh, the uh, uh, state uh, funding uh, process for uh, transit. Uh, through that process, MMT, Colorado Springs, uh, was awarded faster dollars for 10 uh, small bus replacements uh, to the tune of $875,000. And the last one was uh, a new project in Vita, which is uh, a, lo a local agency, uh, was 
um, awarded uh, $67,340 for uh, vehicle replacement. Uh, and those funds come from uh, state uh, SB228 dollars. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions, but hopefully you don't have any uh, because I don't know as much as Catherine does, but I will work through it. I will get you an answer. Any questions? Patty Venger, I'm sorry to do this to you, John. <laughs> I do have a couple of questions. Sure, we'll um, work and through it together. And it may be more philosophical and process just because I'm not familiar with this kind of thing. So for the 10 small bus replacements, I assume that they're replacing them with newer models that the capacity isn't changing. Is that correct? Um, that I don't know uh, specifically, but we can get to uh, see that the division of transfer. It would be attachment number one. Do you have that, Jess? Um, but yeah, normally if they're if they're saying they're replacing the vehicles, that means they're retiring um, older ones, and usually um, it would be a one for one sort of thing. But I don't know that for a fact. Okay. Um, and I guess my other question is, since we are, um, since this amendment is helping to fund new uh, vehicles, do, who gets to keep the old ones? And if they're sold, who gets those proceeds? So if something is purchased with federal dollars, you have to um, keep it through its, its functional life. And in, in, in the case of buses, it's usually 20 years. Again, I'm not a, a federal bean counter, so, you know, don't, don't, uh, do all your money on the final jeopardy question that that's correct, but I, I'm pretty sure that that's the way it works. And so once something's reached its functional life, it is up to that organization to then uh, dispose of those assets. Because they were paid for with federal dollars, uh, usually um, they're sold at some sort of auction. And uh, there's like actually some companies that, that do that sort of thing where they, they get it and they, they get it and they, they, uh, they do the auction and then they provide the money back to the jurisdiction. But uh, not to bore people with my stories, you know, back in Arizona, we actually sold a, you know, a, a eight person passenger van uh, through uh, eBay, I think, or Craigslist. So it, it, you just have to dispose of it in a, in a way that makes sense. So that's the actual disposal will be up to MMT um, and they have to make sure that um, ultimately they're following uh, the necessary federal regulations. But more often than not, uh, they're disposed of um, at, in a, using a public uh, a process. Is anyone from MMT on that could answer, by the way? No, I guess not. So uh, Patty, we could certainly um, contact MMT and then send you an email if, if, if you'd like. You know, it's just a matter of curiosity and I'm still learning um, some of these things as they come through. So if you don't mind following up offline later, just for my own personal knowledge. Yeah, no, no problem. We will contact MMT. Um, and ask them to send us an email and then we'll forward it on to you. Sounds great. From there. Okay. Thank you. So hopefully we can still move forward with the amendment that doesn't, isn't something that uh, makes you want to vote no, so. Thank you. Are we ready for the vote on this action item? Make a motion. Okay, do we have a motion to uh, either approve or deny? This Roy motion? Rosenthal, I'll move to accept the TIP amendment. Okay. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor of uh, approving this uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Next one. We need, if you would put that on the screen so I can figure out what the next one is. Okay. Item B, PPACG MMT Transit Safety Target Setting. Uh, John, I have a feeling you're going to talk again. And, and I am going to talk again, and I apologize for that. Uh, but I, I try to be somewhat uh, uh, lively, at least. So, you know. All right. So on the... Um, uh, oh, I'm trying to call up my notes, because again, Catherine was the one that was sort of uh, doing all of these, but... Uh, all right. Well, uh, I can't seem to... I keep calling, clicking the button and getting the same thing over and over again. So I'm gonna go through my memory. So uh, this item is the uh, uh, tra transit safety targets. Again, you've seen this last month with, with Catherine. 
um, for information. It's coming back to you now for action. Uh, just to refresh your memory, um, federal requirements uh, for performance measures require that the transit agency, in this case, with uh, Mountain Metro Transit, um, put together a uh, uh, safety targets of uh, the different uh, things that they want to try to achieve. That is then shared with the MPO, and the MPO then has the option of um, uh, joining with the transit agency or doing something different. Um, we've chose to uh, work with the transit agency and have one um, coordinated uh, performance measure, uh, a set of performance measures uh, for the region. Um, they have to be um, approved um, at least every four years, but you could do it more often if you'd like, but I think we're, we're shooting for that uh, uh, less stringent uh, uh, timeline. Um, so at this point, um, and, and then Jess, if you want to sort of scroll down to what the, those actually are, um, we are looking for um, approval of those targets um, that we would then uh, send on to uh, FHWA uh, as the uh, safety performance uh, targets uh, for the region. Is there any, any questions? Any question on this one? It's kind of, it's brought back to us. We had it once before, correct? If not, yeah. look for the same motion. Patty Bencher, I recommend adoption of the MMT safety targets for inclusion in the LRTP and TIP and to make updates to the targets as part of the LTRP system performance report updates every four years along with the other FHWA required performance measure targets. <laughs> this is Shelly Rose, I second. <laughs> Sally, are you seconding it? Okay. Shelly, sorry, yes sir, Shelly. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all those signify, uh, all those that want to vote yes, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. We can, the next item, I think John's still up there. Um, All right. I was I was thinking maybe trying to do this item with a, like a pirate thing, but I'm just going to do it straight. So, uh, John, John, let me read it first, so we get it in the oh, record. Sure. FFY 2022-2023 uh, UPWP adoption. There we go. All right. Thank you. And again, this is an item you've seen before. Um, Catherine brought it to you uh, last month as the uh, information and this month it's for action. But just to refresh your memory, the mm -hmm. unit uh, work program uh, basically is the document uh, that PPACG puts together um, with our federal funding partners, Federal Highway Administration and Federal Transit Administration that says, they say, these are the planning dollars we're giving you. And PPACG says, these are the activities that we are doing with those funds. So that's basically in a nutshell what the UPWP is. Um, this particular document uh, Catherine has done a great job of updating it. And if you see in your uh, memo, she sort of summarized what some of the different changes are. We've added some uh, public outreach and involvement language. Um, we've moved the, the accomplishments uh, before they were sort of broken up into the different sections of the document. And she's now moved them all into uh, section two. Um, she's combined the expenditure tables. So it's a little more intuitive for you to be able to uh, attract the funding and she's uh, reorganized all of the different work elements. Um, so with that, there's a few more of the changes on the next page, uh, but in the interest of time, because again, you have seen this before, um, I'll just sort of skip to, uh, again, uh, at, at this point, uh, the TAC has reviewed the item and has recommended approval. Hopefully you will um, have a like motion today so it can go to the board of directors um, at their next meeting. Uh, to be approved uh, for uh, the uh, fiscal years 2022 to 2023. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Anybody like to ask a question, John, on this side? Okay, if not, we'll be looking for a motion. This is Miley, I'll go ahead and make that motion. Uh, the motion to recommend that the PPACG Board of Directors adopt the FFY 
2022 to 2023, UPWP. Thank you. Do I have a second? Mr. Gordon Rick, and I second the motion. I have a second by Gordon. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same side. None heard, motion carried. Next item, John, I think you're off the hook on this one. Yep. Unless Thanks, they all left and you're covering for them. Yep. Okay, F FTA 5310 funding recommendation, Laura Cruz, mobility coordinator. Hi. <laughs> I am Laura Cruz, Mobility Coordinator for PPACG. Um, many of you guys have seen me in Zoom over the past several months, um, but I have actually two things to bring before you today. The first thing that um, I'm bringing before you is actually a um, funding recommendations for our 5310 project. Um, so for those of you who may be new, um, we became the designated recipient of FTA 5310 funds for enhanced mobility of seniors and persons with disabilities. And so what that means is basically we, um, as an organization now, um, facilitate the uh, specialized transportation funding through the AAA, as well as the specialized transportation funding available for our urbanized area um, through FTA. And this is our first year um, implementing the program. Um, we've actually been working with three providers um, who were contractors of MMT in the past to help us through the first six months of transition. So we have been contracting with them through an emergency provision over the past six months. And now we've been able to go through a um, notice, of funding uh, notice of funding availability and a um, um, four um, applicants have applied for funding um, once that was launched. And so the four applicants that have applied for funding um, are Invita, Silver Key, Fountain Valley Senior Center, and Community Intersections. And um, we formulated a review committee of um, RAC members as well as um, a member from CDOT who deals with these programs a lot to help us evaluate those um, proposals. And so through that evaluation process, we had a score sheet that um, looked at different things, looked at different criteria uh, in terms of need, financial management um, capabilities, um, uh, service measures, how it aligns with our coordinated transit plan, which is a requirement uh, of 5310. And so those criteria that are listed here um, were the things that were taken into account as the review committee was looking at each proposal. Um, out of that process, we did recognize a couple of things with, within the proposals. Um, one agency, and you'll see here, Community Intersections does not have any funding tied to the funding recommendation. Um, it being a new program, it's been a bumpy road, <laughs> I will say, in implementing. And so we've learned a lot. And, and a few things that we learned through the review process and getting more guidance from FTA is um, uh, more guidance on the openness and the definition of public transportation and how people have to be able to access public transportation in FT, through FTA dollars. And so um, in, in reviewing community intersections um, proposal, um, their proposal was set around a, a, a very small subset group um, through sort of a, a workforce program that they provide transportation. So it wasn't something that, that I could call up and, and book a ride. Um, at least that was what was presented to us. Um, so in getting guidance from FTA on a, evaluating that, as well as looking at just their overall scores and areas of um, mission alignment, coordinated um, services. So um, amongst the, the four, three of them actually operate on the same platform, um, service platform, so that they can actually book rides for each other. Um, and so those agencies scored higher on that coordinating um, scale. Um, also reach, 
um, it was mentioned in their proposal that only it was mentioned in their proposal that they serve 36 individuals through this workforce program um, with transportation. And again, that kind of shows a smaller reach. So um, in doing that assessment, um, the committee recommended not funding that program uh, this year because it didn't align with the public transportation um, definition as well as scored low in, in some of the criteria um, other than they did score high in terms of um, financial management, which is a huge thing with federal grants. Um, and so I think that um, throughout that process, it was, it was a hard decision, but um, in order for us to stay in compliance, we couldn't fund that agency this year. So that's the rec recommendation with that agency. Um, the other four other three agencies, Silver Key, Invita, and Fountain Valley, both in Vita and, and Silver Key scored high um, and they were pretty much aligned in their scores. Um, we also looked at the fact that um, both of those agencies in the coordinating piece with the three agencies, they utilized a system called Route Match. And those two agencies um, had a lot of inputs within that system of making for sure it runs. <laughs> Um, and Vita has kind of taken on the role of being sort of the technical assistance for, for the, the three agencies. And, and in looking at that and their financial management capabilities, um, those scored the highest and the um, review committee decided that, decided to recommend that their ask be funded fully, um, as well as making for sure that we still were able to continue to work with Fountain Valley. Fountain Valley had some, um, some lower scores in the financial management piece, as well as a slightly lower scores in the coordination piece. And so um, the recommendation is to fully fund Invita and um, Silver Keys ask, as well as utilizing the leftover funds to partially fund um, Fountain Valley's ask. Um, so in the, the memo, it kind of talks through the numbers of that. It's about 30,000 less than what um, Fountain Valley originally asked for. We had $958,000 worth of um, asks to us through this um, RFP process. And um, we have $816,000 to allocate for this funding. So um, had to make some decisions on that. So. We have brought these recommendations to the TAC. We're bringing them to you guys. I do have to make one note. We have had an appeal um, by Community Intersections that was submitted to us yesterday. Um, we are, um, that appeal was sent to Jody Barker, our AAA director, and he and I are both assessing that appeal um, and we'll have uh, communications with that agency. Our goal is to figure out how we can continue to fund programs, even if they may not meet the funding uh, source, how can we fund programs if they don't meet that funding source that are vital to our community? And so those are just opportunities for us in the future. So the proposed, proposed motion is to recommend approval of these recommendations um, from our review committee and from the TAC for you guys to pass it on to the board. Question. So, um, I have a question. Have you talked to Jolene about this? Yes. Okay, so she's fully aware. Yes. Yes, and that's a great question. Thank you, Sharon. Um, just to uh, also, I'm, I meant to say this, and I said this in the beginning, we did have some public comments at the TAC committee um, meeting, and both Jolene and um, Jason from, uh, Jason De Bueno from uh, Silver Key um, supported the motion. Um, there is a, a request of PPACG to um, look at the possibilities of them being able to subcontract with each other um, in case there is um, <laughs> crazy things like catalytic converters stolen and things like that. Um, that things problem. happen and, and yeah. maybe some funding shortages. That's something that we have to look within the FTA regs, whether that's a possibility for us to be able to, to allow that. Um, but uh, I think all of them knew that we, that the committee did their best to, to score these um, in a competitive nature, which is a little bit different right. than what they've dealt with in the past. We have to do that with FTA grant dollars. 
Okay, okay. <laughs> Thank just, you. Just a question on the, the community intersections. I've not heard of that before. Is that a geographic area specific? Is it a regional thing? Is it, you know, can you give us a little bit of background on that? Yeah, so, and, and to be honest, this is an organization that I'm a little less familiar with. Um, I was working with them through the RFP process and, and gaining some more knowledge about them. Um, they are kind of centralized here in the city um, with their programming. It is a larger organization, I think, based in California. Um, but there is a, a program hub here in Colorado Springs. And um, they mostly work with the um, development, developmentally disabled individuals um, and help them out with workforce programs and those types of things. Um, so uh, the, the challenge <laughs> that that we've been brought with, with the 5310 funding is we, we can't utilize the funds to fund a program that is a closed program. So it, the FTA funding is set aside for public transportation. So accessibility is huge. Yeah. And so while what community intersections taking those 36 individuals to Fort Carson for a workforce program is, is amazing. It doesn't fit the, the criteria of this. So, yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, I have a question. This is Carol Campbell. Um, I have a question relative to if we are to make a motion, does it need to be contingent on that appeal or is that just a separate question? Um, that is a great question. And maybe John can kind of help me out with this. Um, to my knowledge, it does not have to be contingent upon that appeal. So that appeal process will, um, we have 10 days to respond. Um, and so we will respond, to, we will respond to that appeal, but ultimately it's, it's our decision. Okay. Yep. Got it. Hi, this is Shelly. Um, your decision with regards to the intersections group you said that there is, um, it's a closed group. So they don't accept just anyone into their group and that's what disqualifies them for this money? Great question, Shelly. No, not exactly, okay. So their programs are open to individuals to be enrolled in their programs. However, what's considered a closed and open type of transportation, I, the best case scenario that I can I, I can kind of give an example of is FTA wants it to wants us to fund projects that ultimately the general public can access. So say for instance, they call um, in the past the one ride number of, of MMT. We have to, as now a, a transportation transit uh, dollar provider, we have to be able to refer people should they need a ride to, you know, the grocery store? <laughs> it has to be something that we can actually refer people out to and people can access to do everyday things because 5310 is a supplement to paratransit dollars. It's going beyond what paratransit services can provide. And so paratransit services is open to the general public within the, um, the, um, the, different ADA um, provisions that they're able to provide through paratransit. So specialized transit dollars are kind of an extension of that to be able to provide door through door services. So ultimately, if it's a program that's for specific programming, like a workforce um, program, then that's not really something that's open for somebody to call in and say, hey, I need a ride. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Thank you for the clarification. Okay. Anybody else? Question, John DeVoe. Um, when you take that total amount of money, eight or nine hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars, how many people does that serve? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> um, I'll have to pull. I'll have to get that to you because I'll have to pull that from their um, applications. But I know that right now. Let's see. Let me send that out to you guys, because that is a great question. I should have done that. But the extent of it, actually, I may have it here. Ah. Let's see. 
All right. So looking at, we are 31,000 rides. So that average is about it's around $30 a ride. $30 a ride. Yes. Okay. In the case of the one that is appealing, mm -hmm. that 36,000 for one event, I mean, 36, how much, 36 people, how much money did that cost? For 36 people, and they were using this, this is the other part of their grant. They were using this as a supplement of funding for rides that typically get paid for through other programs like Medicaid and that kind of thing. Gotcha. So their cost per ride was really low. It was $7.84 okay. with those offsets. So it was equal to 13,839 rides for those 36 people throughout the week. I mean, throughout the year. If somebody needs a ride to the doctor or something like that, of those four agencies or so, can they can call any of them? Yeah, and, and well, not community intersections <laughs> from, from what we understand. Um, and we, we actually had one of, the, um, one of the committee members called community intersections to figure out how you know, to access a ride. And um, they were not successful. There has been some changes, I will say this, and, and I've been working with community intersections a little bit more over the past few months. They were connected with MMT's One Ride Center. So there was some, re there was some mechanism in the past to be able to refer people to community intersections for some rides. Now they were one of the smaller, they were the, the smallest contractor of MMT. And so since One Ride, MMT's One Ride has dissolved, um, that program has dissolved, um, since then, Invita has taken on the one ride, one ride number. Um, the group has rebranded it as Mobility on Demand. Um, and Community Intersections has not fallen into that fold of those other three since then. And so there's been a lot of you know, kind of pushing on my part as well, just trying to figure out how to reconnect people once we've had this big transition between MMT managing the program and now us. So. Um, does that answer your question? Do you have numbers for show up time? How long it takes to respond? Somebody calls up and they need a ride? For, calls up, if they call the mobility on demand number, they are getting a person. How long before the people get there? Um, do you, could you carry it's, those statistics? I can get those statistics for you. I just was curious. Yeah, and it's different per agency too. I will say that, you know, um, certain agencies like Silver Key and, and Vita and, and Fountain Valley, they each have their own capacity. Um, but I will say this, what has been amazing is <clears throat> of those agencies, they're not dropping rides because they're able to coordinate with each other. In the past, there was this ride drop of, hey, we had to deny a ride because we did, we, they weren't connected with each other. Now that's not happening. And so they're able to, if Silver Key can't take that ride, Invita will take it for them. That kind of coordination. And also they're trying to continue to, to um, close the timing of when somebody has to book a ride and then get it. So, you know, typically a lot of paratransit services, it's two weeks you need to book your ride out. They're trying to get that down to less than 48 hours. Okay. It's a big deal. If, do you have people that try to abuse it and they call up all of them and see who shows up first? Or, I, is the, or the system between each other and stop that? They're all connected. So, the, okay. The, they'll see. That's gonna yeah. Happen. And they're actually, they're actually on the same call system now. So, okay. they've all gotten onto a system called Ring Central. So say for instance, you know, and this is very new, so it's still kind of working out the kinks. So say for instance, a call gets rolled to Silver Key because all the lines are, are booked at Invita. Somebody's going to get answered 
And if even if Silver Key answers that phone call, they can book that ride for Fountain Valley. Okay. Yeah. Sounds like this has been growing pains and you're getting better. <laughs> it has been growing pains and it has been growing pains for this whole group. Um, just in the past year, they connected themselves through the route match system, which allows them to book rides. Um, just in the past year, they connected themselves and took on the one ride number, knowing that they didn't have the capacity of the one ride call center that MMT had, that they had to build a network so that they could manage those calls. They also stepped it up to the plate and created a separate number um, for transportation assistance for vaccinations for the general population. Didn't have to be a senior, didn't have to be um, an individual with a disability. You called that number, you would get booked on a ride to a vaccination site. So that group has really done some amazing things this year to kind of move the needle and work together. Excellent. I think yeah. the other thing from a senior perspective is that uh, I know that Invita has volunteer drivers. So when we talk about the number of rides that are funded federally, if you will, <clears throat> you get an awful lot more of, of rides because of volunteer drivers in each geographic area. Yes. It really does make a difference. I think Silver Key does the same thing. Silver Key does too. And, and Fountain Valley as mm -hmm. well. So, I mean, those are really positive things. Again, that's the citizens stand, standing up and saying, okay, I can help out. Let's, let's do this. It has a huge, huge mm -hmm. impact on the community. Yeah, I will say that their costs have gone up this year because of COVID restrictions. Um, while just a week ago, CDOT um, lifted the COVID restrictions for transportation, kind of overall broadly, um, Hickpuff hasn't. And so there's Hickpuff is like the the Medicaid program um, for transportation, and so while we're still dealing with some of these lifts of regulations and not, in talking with the Mobility Coordinating Committee yesterday though, they each expressed um, sort of concern kind of rolling back some of these restrictions with the types of populations that they serve um, because they don't want to be um, someone who contributes or an organization that contributes to anyone getting the coronavirus. And so um, they're cautiously looking at those rollbacks of those restrictions and seeing if they want to implement them or not. Um, so yeah, their costs have gone up because they can't put 15 people on a bus. They can only put five people on a bus. So we, we've had to kind of look at that too um, from their budget perspective. Did you come to us once before and explain this? I did not. Somebody else did, because I remember <laughs> it about uh, the, the demographics of the most active uh, people that you were like 17 to 24 or something. That, like that. was MMT. I okay. think that was MMT that presented to you guys. I'm pretty sure that that was, they did their survey of their clients um, and presented that, I think last month or the month before. Yeah. It just seems amazing that many young people are riding at the uh, elderly people weren't as much. Yes. Well, and there's opportunities to to kind of work on that in the future. I think that um, having me as a mobility coordinator and new, I'm sort of an in between our our paratransit, our specialized transit, and our fixed route groups. You know, I I'm kind of uh, I sort of call myself. Um, a, a fair play island here <laughs> that let's just put out some ideas and see how we can work on them because um, they are doing um, some pretty cool things in other cities that would be awesome to implement you've done a very nice job coming here presenting thank this. you been honest in that we hope you come back every so often <laughs> okay and bring up today. <laughs> i'm usually on the call <laughs> <laughs> so and i'm a, you can ask them. I'm I'm always here. <laughs> Anybody else have any other questions, either remote or here? Go. Oh, you got no. Go ahead. You're not. Oh, I was just going to say, very good. Well, thank you. Thank you. Very okay. much appreciated. Um, I just wanted to. You said there's usually just a 48 hour. To, yes, I that's mean that's pretty good. That's, that's what is, they're getting down to. That's, that's what their goal is. I think is. that's amazing. Yeah. To get it down to that. 
Yeah, and Invita has actually increased their fixed route. They actually have a couple of fixed route um, uh, buses that go out, I believe, to the Calhan area. Yeah, and they're working with um, Cripple Creek and working with um, Teller Senior Coalition to do, you know, joint routes. So, they, yes, yeah, somehow. I have put that a bug in their their ear. I'm like, do something in Park County. We'll figure it out. <laughs> so yeah, I think that I think that it's the Teller it's Senior evolve. Coalition has has more vehicles, I think, than the city does. <laughs> well, there's a lot of seniors to move around up there. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Any if if not, we'll look for a motion. I move that we recommend approval to the board, make a motion to recommend approval to the board of the funding and recommendations provided by TRS and TAC. This is Carol, I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor of, of approving this? Aye. 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 Anybody against it? Nay. Motion carried. Thank you. You're gonna hear from me again now. <laughs> I, that's good, I'm glad we do, it's, it's good. You're very informative. And honest. What's that? Nay. 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 The next one. I believe we had one nay. That was Shelly Roars. Thank you very much, Shelly. Okay. Now, did you have that list of which ones we have there yet? Is that is this the last one? Yes. Okay. The subject is changes to the program management plan for the FDA 5310 program. Pending TAC approval. Okay. Who's going to present this? Me. Okay. Um, so we have to put together this very comprehensive um, program management plan um, for the 5310 program. And it just, it details how we're going to administer the funds, who we're going to work with, um, how we're going to manage our reporting, so on and so forth. It's a nice, I think, 60 page document. Um, we have coronavirus funding, <laughs> uh, as most people do. Um, we have coronavirus funding that has been um, passed along to us through the Urbanized Formula um, grants. And that's both um, CRISA funding, don't ask me what that stands for. It's coronavirus response, something, something. Um, it's, it's coronavirus funding, um, as well as uh, American Rescue Plan dollars um, that have been um, allocated to PPACG to distribute. And in order for us to kind of quickly get those dollars out, um, we are requesting a change to our program management plan to allow us to um, allocate those dollars directly to the already um, contracted um, subrecipients instead of having to go through an individual RFP process for every one of those funds. The reason why is these funds are designated to be lifelines to these agencies. And if it takes us four to six months to get through an RFP process for these risk emergency funds, um, that's gonna be a little bit challenging um, when they need it. And so these agencies need it, we need it, we need to be able to distribute it. We're getting um, pressure from FTA to distribute it. So this just allows us when there's emergency funds to have the ability, we may, always, may not always utilize this ability, but have the ability to allocate those to already contracted providers. Um, so that's an addition um, that we would like to make to the program management plan. The second addition um, is actually just a learning curve for us. Um, we, we have pre-spending authority of um, FTA dollars, which what that means is basically we can spend money we can spend FTA dollars without having a grant in place with FTA because we get apportioned those funds. It's, I don't have to apply for the apportionment. The apportionment comes to the Colorado Springs urbanized area. And so with the, 
with a provision added into our program management plan, we can exercise our pre-spending authority. Um, what this allows us to do is, um, I've learned, and this is where I said the learning curve is, it takes time for when you get your apportionment to actually getting a grant approved with FTA. And we can't really deal without services during that time span. <laughs> So this allows us to pay for those services as long as we have contracts in place with those providers, pay for those services um, until we have the official grant in place with FTA. So adding that into um, our program management plan will let us, sit, let us exercise that um, easier in the future. Where's the oversight? The oversight uh, of if you just give them the money and how are you going to track this without going through the RFP process? So that's great. So they don't, so they don't get ahead of you on or a habit. Great. That's a great question. So what we're able to do is actually write our contracts in a sense that we can roll at least these two funds, we can roll these funds into our next contracts with the providers that are um, being recommended. And so the funding is actually for the same activities that they're getting funded through the regular funds. So it's going to be tracked the same. It's just supplementing the program and it's actually allowing us to extend our dollars that we have set aside for this program longer down the road. So the oversight of it is the same. They are, um, let me give you a good example. Dr. Cog does a joint call for um, specialized transit projects. And so basically uh, Dr. Burn. Cog does this joint call and says, okay, we have five different funding streams um, for specialized transportation, we'll allocate those funds based upon what you have asked for and what matches up with it best. We're sure. asking to be able to do the same thing when we do have emergency funds to be able to allocate those um, funds to those specific providers. Okay. Start anybody, right, please. anybody have any questions? Uh, this is Rick Hoover. Uh, what, what do you need for a quorum? Keep for a quorum. What's that? I, I something has come up, and I want to make sure I don't leave you short of a quorum if I have to leave. <laughs> we require seven for a quorum, Rick. It'll be okay if you have to. Okay, go. thank you kindly. I I have a question regarding this. Um, is there a time limit or a dollar limit? on how long you can uh, use this uh, temporary allocation or whatever you want to call it of, hey, I can go ahead and spend this money. Uh, is there a time limit of how many months you can do this without uh, authorization or a dollar limit? Are you talking about the uh, pre-spending authority? Yes. Great question. Um, <laughs> There is not a written time limit. <laughs> um, and the reason why is a couple of things. Those of you know that uh, Congress doesn't always pass the budget on time. So um, they don't put time limits on those things because of reasons like that. You may be operating in a continuing resolution um, and your limitations are within that time are are to the gods trying to figure out, you know, when you're actually going to have an approved budget. So that's why there's not a time limit on it. However, as soon as we get, um, as soon as we go through our RFP process, we're going to start our grant with FTA. So our grant, just in our experience over the past few months, uh, we got our apportionment from FTA for this year, um, for this fiscal year, in um, at the end of February. So that's actually supposed to be approved in October. So if you can kind of understand, we didn't get it approved in October. So we got our apportionment in February. 
in February, we started our grant with um, FTA. We were able to write our grant with FTA. It took us about um, a month to do so. New funding came in, we had to kind of reassess. Um, and actually everybody had to redo their applications because new funding came in. And so then we rewrote our grant. It was approved. Um, it was approved in March. So it's about a two to three months span of when you get your apportionment, um, when you're able to get your grant in, and when you're able to actually get that grant approved. We're not gonna wait um, ever to put a grant in the system. We do have to wait until we actually have money apportioned to us. So, Typically, what I've seen is there's a limit of either dollars or time of how much you could spend. If we were to recommend, say, a 12-month limit, you can, you can temporarily go ahead and start this thing. But once you hit that 12-month mark, yeah, you got to have something approved or you got to stop spending it. How, how would that impact you? So um, just to be clear, we are actually not spending dollars during that time. And that's actually, that's a great question, uh, Gordon. Um, it just gives us the ability to reimburse our expenses once the money is available to us. Okay. So, and, and it's written into our contracts with providers that there may be a delay in payments to them if there's a delay within that system that gets us the money. Okay. Does that so make not, sense? We're not spending money without authorization. We're Correct. just saying we will reimburse you once spending is approved. Correct. Okay. That answers yeah. my question. Thank you. Anybody else? Does the contract you have with the providers uh, state what their limit is? Yes, it does have a, a like the, num the numbers that we presented for the next recommendation of funding, it does have that limit on it. Unless they ask for an increase and justify why and all that kind of stuff. Well, we don't have any money to, to okay. give them an increase. So be another grant. Or something <laughs> yeah. Like yes. If we, if we received another grant, then we would actually issue a, another um, contract for them okay. because the good thing about the FTA grants and, and the emergency funds, we can kind of wrap that into one contract because it's under the funds are coming from one source. Okay. But if, say, for instance, we get some CDOT funding like we did a, a few months ago, then we would have to um, have a separate contract for that. Anybody else have any other questions for her? Uh, okay. Patty Benger, I do. Okay. Um, and, and this may be um, within that document, so I apologize if I'm asking you to clarify that, but um, what is the risk of that grant not being approved? And if that does happen, how is that handled? So the interesting nature of formula funds is the money is apportioned to the region. And so we're the only designated rep, um, recipient, great. <laughs> only designated recipient of 5310 funds. So if there's an issue with our grant with FTA, and we have we work side by side with FTA in writing these grants. Mm -hmm. um, we actually have a representative that, that sits down with me kind of virtually now, but sits down with me and goes through that grant with us each time. So um, if there's an issue with the grant, then it just gets bounced back to me, but we still have the pre-spending authority that once our grant is approved, we can still account for all those costs. It's, it's a little interesting nature because you're not really applying for a grant. Your grant is really just your statement of work, if that makes more sense. Yes, yeah, so it's not a competitive grant process that we're doing. No, it is not. We are the only 5310 recipient in uh, the Colorado Springs urbanized area. And there can only be, I believe one. <laughs> so, okay, yes. Thank you. Is the provider protected from you if all of a sudden for some reason the funds are cut off? Well, and that's a risk. That, that is actually a risk with 
AAA funding. That is a risk with the FTA funding. That's a risk with anything that we do. Um, and that is something that, you know, specifically when you're dealing with um, federal and, and state funds, you're, you're always going to be operating in a weird space until your budget gets approved. You have to trust each other. Yeah. Do. Okay. Um, Patty Benger, I recommend the PPACG Board of Directors approve the changes to the 5310 Program Management Plan. Need a second. second. Dave. Dave Betzler seconds it. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passed. I think that's all of them, isn't it? Thank you. Member discussion. Anything you folks want to all talk about? Gosh, I think I've talked more than any I have ever before in this meeting. So <laughs> um, I represent um, the city of Colorado Springs, and you may not be aware that um, July 31st um, is our 150th birthday, our sesquicentennial, I think is how you say that. Um, and there's a couple of events I wanted to make sure everyone knew about because they're going to be great. Um, on June 12th, there's a Beards, Bonnets, and Brews Festival. They'll have 30 different breweries, live music, and food trucks, games that were played in the 1800s, and historic actors. It'll be at Rockledge Ranch, and it's free admission. But, um, but tickets are available. Sorry, this is uh, Carol Patty. I'm, I'm on the committee. There oh, are great. tickets available for beer tasting. Um, we are limiting those to 4,000 tickets to keep the capacity down. And we fully intend to sell all those tickets before the event. I don't I actually have the website right here because I brought posters. It is coloradosprings.gov slash beards, bonnets, brews. Um, so buy your tickets early and often. How much are the tickets? $22, and it gets you a commemorative um, uh, mason jar that's got the logo <laughs> on it, and then you get 10 pours, and they're like like four-ounce pours. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually right. not a bad deal at all. <laughs> you may get a lot of phone calls that day. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> I live close enough I can walk home. You right, could. exactly. <laughs> yeah. You could. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Carol, for helping with that. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, and feel free to chime in if you know about the Adventure Passport, because that was the next thing I wanted to let everybody know about. The Adventure Passport started this past weekend. Um, it's a thing that they've designed for grades second to fifth grade, another free item. Um, all ages are welcome, but you go to six different sites and you get a passport there. When you're done, you can turn that in for a special prize. So it's just another way for younger people in our community to learn about the history of Colorado Springs. Cool. Excellent. I didn't know about that, but I also would tell you that June is um, Pedal Our Pass Month. Normally the month of June is Bike to Work Week or is Bike Month with Bike to Work Day at the end of the month um, because of COVID last year. And again, this year we've shifted, but this year we've shifted to where it um, integrates the 150th anniversary. So we've created five specific biking routes that will have signage pointing out areas of his historic interest and significance and that sort of thing. Um, and that is actually completely free. We're just encouraging people to run, uh, to ride, follow us on social media, um, but that'll kick off on June 1. You're not gonna paint more streets, are you? I don't think so. <laughs> okay, just, just asking. But you will see a lot more bikes than normal. <laughs> okay, that's good. That's yeah. Good. Okay, um, any other member discussions remotely or here? Okay, uh, at that point. Go ahead, Ann. Um, I just want, I wasn't able to print out all the recent stuff that we've been looking at, and I couldn't read it on the screen for some reason. But I wanted to just say that uh, Green Mountain Falls, we were very active with trying to be, prepare for the fire season. And uh, in cooperation with some other uh, towns up here, I think we are applying for uh, some funds that recently became available through the state to, uh, we don't know if we're gonna get it, but <laughs> to help uh, prevent uh, forest fires up here in the mountains. And uh, that's being worked on and uh, has been submitted. It was submitted May 19th, just in time 
<clears throat> and we won't know for a while, unfortunately. Um, I also wanted to mention just and thank her regionally uh, that our wonderful uh, town planner, Julia Simmons, has resigned her position in Green Mountain Falls and we'll really miss her. She's been so helpful in our old, over a hundred year old town with strange terrain, trying to keep it running. And um, I also will have a question whether or not the PPACG has a, an environmental person hired to replace uh, the young lady who resigned. We do not yet have our environmental person. We are mm -hmm. planning on hiring our military program manager first, and we're stuck mm -hmm. waiting for a Depart Department of Defense grant to come in. So oh. once the DOD grant comes in, we can hire that person, and then we can start looking for our new environmental planner. We do actually currently have two open positions in other places. We're looking for a senior administrative assistant and a ombudsman. And both of those positions are currently open and you can find information on them on the PPACG website. And the CAC opening is still available for applicants until 5 p.m. on Friday. So for folks who want to pass those three things along to anybody, two jobs and a CAC opportunity, we'd love to have you be sharing this into the community. What's the CAC opportunity? What does that mean? We have an at-large vacancy. Oh, okay. Because Aubrey had to step down. So we oh. are we posted that out and sent it out, but I've got three applicants. I'm more than happy to see if we can get some more. So she purposely okay. said that one doesn't get paid. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I I, I I did. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, this is Gordon Rick. Just a quick reminder to everybody. Uh, schools letting out. We're getting a lot of kids that are going to be out and about and we just need to be safe when we're driving out there. I uh, hate to see some little kid be injured or pass on due to traffic accidents. Thank you. Items for the next CAC committee meeting? Anybody got some, some burning desire you want us to talk about next time? Okay. Um, do you have anything else? Seeing one, I would look for a motion to adjourn. So moved, Sharon Brown. I'll second that. <laughs> Carol Campbell seconds it. And all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 <laughs> Thanks, folks. I think we had a good meeting. Yep. Yeah, and uh, we'll see you all in 30 days or so. Yep. Thereabouts. See you all next month. That worked out well. I thought that worked.